gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rubin, let me come to you because as these decisions continue to get made with regards to the validity of the Iran deal, as, as we would call it, decisions by members of Congress hinge on very small, sometimes often minute pieces of information uh, where they can justify going one way or another. Uh, do you believe that some of the statements by Mr. Rhodes uh, was a factor at all in some of the members of Congress uh, casting their vote one way or another? Yes, and I can give you examples if you would like. Please. Well, first of all, when it comes to verification, according to U.S. law incumbent with the corker cardin compromise, all agreements are supposed to be pre presented to Congress. Now it emerges that there were secret side agreements with the IAEA. One of these secret side agreements that comes into play with regard to verification is that the State Department agreed that the IAEA would not need to report to the level it had reported under sanctions, especially with regard to the possible military dimensions. So to say that the IAEA has said that verification, that Iran is complying with the deal, that's like bragging that someone is the valedictorian of the summer school class. So it becomes a major problem. It lets them off the hook, and we only found out about that afterwards because the White House kept it secret. Well, uh, we've had sworn testimony both in a uh, number of House committees and Senate committees where the sworn testimony by administration officials were that there are no and were no secret side agreements. Would you say that that's a credible argument under sworn testimony to make? They are lying to Congress. All right, so that's a pretty bold statement, Mr. Rubin, uh, Mr. Rubin that they're lying to Congress. Uh, so if we go back and look at the tapes where they say that there was no side agreements in sworn testimony, do you think it's incumbent upon this committee to hold those particular individuals who gave sworn testimony in contempt of Congress? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. Let me go on a little bit further because the troubling aspect of this is for somehow members on the other side of the aisle to suggest that there is wrongdoing in previous administrations that would justify wrongdoing in a current administration. Is it your opinion, Mr. Rubin, that regardless of who the administration might be, whether it be Republican or Democrat, that it's incumbent upon them to be honest and straightforward with Congress when they are negotiating something of this type of magnitude? Yes. National security should not be a political football. So is it your sworn testimony here today that because of the talking points of Mr. Rhodes and the inaccuracy, or as you would characterize them, lying that took place, that the whole debate that transpired within Congress was based on faulty assumptions that had no relevance uh, or relationship to truth. It was almost as if instead of looking at the whole chessboard, the White House was just directing Congress to look at four pieces. So if we were only looking at four pieces and something that is so critical to national security, and to the security of our allies, Israel, do you think that it was disingenuous to suggest that some of the talking points that were coming out of the Israeli government were indeed characterized as being dishonest and uh, not truthful? Do you think an apology is owed by this administration to that government? You know, this administration has a sorry record at this point of coddling adversaries and throwing allies under the bus, perhaps apologies are due when domestic Washington politics got in the way of serious foreign policy discourse. I thank you, Mr. Rubin. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Now recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, at the heart of this, 